I've done more interviews, I think, in the last three months than I have in my whole life. <laughs> right, right. So. Yeah. yeah, you guys are right in the center of the storm. So. <sighs> Isn't that the truth? Well, we stayed at 11 cases for so long, and mm -hmm. then kaboom. Yep, I attended one of the Unified Command meetings right before St. Patrick's Day, and I just remember having that sense that we have to do something because this is going to get crazy really fast. And we did, and then we sort of hit this wall where it wasn't crazy for a while. Right. And you kind of lose people's interest in participating in what it really means, which I suppose is how the pandemic in 1918 went, too. You took care of it when you were in the moment of it, and then you let it go, and then it snuck back up on you. Right, so. right. But we're in the heart of it now. This has definitely been the roughest month. Well, I was watching Dr. Fauci. He was saying that 45% of the people don't show symptoms. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it was that high. Yeah, you know, and coronavirus is a cold virus. I mean, we have lots of coronaviruses, right. and people get a cold, and I think it's the same thing with the common cold. People may carry it and be spreaders of it and not have any symptoms. That's how colds make their way around the globe so quickly. This is one's just different. It's different in the fact that one, we've never seen it, and two, we have some really bad effects that can happen with it. And I think that's the part that all of us are just a little bit frightened of. Yeah. The part I worry about is the cardiovascular effects that can happen kind of out of nowhere, which my experience taking care of the, of the very frail, that seems to be a lot of what happens is they're going along and they may seem like they're sort of pulling through and then all of a sudden, they're not, and that's been really that's really right. been the cardiovascular or the, the clotting kind of component where the body goes through some sort of autoimmune response. And, you know. The part about all of this that I think is interesting is how much we continue to be attracted to the really fearful stuff of it. And I did. I had to call a gentleman today and tell him that he was COVID positive, and he was so mad. He was so mad because he says, I've been doing everything. I've been following all the rules. I've done everything they're telling me on the television. And I've only been out of my apartment one time in the last eight days. And it was must have been then. That must have been when I got it. To the grocery store. Or yep, something. yep. Some the grocery store, one of the stores. Do you think that the uh, COVID epidemic will affect uh, how the, the uh, health center operates in the future? even after things calm down a bit? Or... Yeah, I, I think it will in two different areas. Number one, we, um, I would say in healthcare, we are taught about infectious disease and we have sort of our infectious disease management and protocols and we learn those when we go through school and we all practice them. We don't practice them to this level and so I think it's definitely turned things upside down to look at the way buildings are built spaces are developed, um, people are trained on the whole use of PPE and how infectious disease works. And I think that's definitely going to be way more in the forefront of all people who come into the health center and participate in the, in the programming there. And second, you know, healthcare is one of our largest industries in this country, um, but healthcare is still being affected. I mean, we are seeing a lot less patients in a year than we would in any other year. Um, there's just not as many encounters with people because we've had to kind of close down the lobbies and not bring so many people into the building for fear of infecting more people. Um, and, and so I, I would say that just based on the financial and the revenue part of it, it in healthcare alone, it's going to take health centers and other businesses time to you know come back out of this. Right. Right, hospitals uh, have fewer elective surgeries, right? Mm -hmm. So when I was younger, I was a supply guy in a hospital. We kept hearing, you know, that OR provides 80% of our income. Yep, so <laughs> Take right. care of them. Yeah. yeah, and that's what I guess, you know, I mean, the one of the things as the CEO that I'm really fighting to not ever have to do is, you know, we don't want to lay people off. We don't want to have to um, downsize the ship because of what's happened with this pandemic. And so we're, you know, we're really trying to balance 
protecting the providers and the employees that we have right now and one helping so that they don't, they don't get the virus two taking care of their mental health because it's pretty you know it's quite a bit of anguish working in this field right now and then three you know protecting the longevity of are they going to have work this year next year the year after and and that means you know making good decisions to hopefully you know protect the bottom line the county leadership seems to be pretty cohesive you know you guys don't have, seem to have much division in the, the yeah. ranks there we um you know, so we as a health center um, have a clinic in Anaconda and a clinic in Dillon and then one here. Oh. And, and participate, we participate at a state level through the Montana Primary Care Association, which is based in Helena, but they're sort of our political lobbying group um, in addition to a, lots of training and um, collaboration amongst the different health centers. And so every Monday I'm on a phone call where we participate with the other CEOs around the state at the health centers. And a lot of counties are struggling with the fact that they, you know, they're on one side of a, of a political belief and not another. And they're taking that out on each other based on how they feel about it politically, it seems like. Um, I would say Butte in general has felt that most people believe in the science. They believe the fact that this is a, a real entity that we don't have control over. We need to do our best to try to prevent. And um, because they all sort of have kind of fallen into that camp, it has made it a much more cohesive group, willing to have good dialogue and move forward. Um, but, you know, some of the other counties are not operating at the same level. And as you can see around the state, a lot of public health officers have resigned because the pressure that they're feeling trying to uphold the scientific platform hasn't really gone very well. You know, masks became politicized. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like brushing your teeth would become politicized. I know. Yeah. It is my biggest fear right now because we're on the forefront of the vaccine coming toward us. and. You know, there are two camps about vaccines well before pandemic. There were people who did not believe we should vaccinate the human body with as many vaccines as we do. And there are some people that have chosen not to do any vaccines. And um, that goes back again to our science and what we as a human race have been able to develop, something to prevent an illness that kills a lot of people. In this situation, it's been politicized. It's been politicized where there's the phenomenons going on or out there that they're trying to microchip people you know there are there are discussions going on about there about a couple of instances of negative sequelae related to vaccines so that's one of the areas that i would say you know based on the politics i hope we can one stay away from the fear mongering that goes on in the in the press and to the politics of it and we can just really read and understand and trust the science about what a vaccine will do for us. You know, do you have patients that come in that are, you know, that hear rumors and they're, you know, truly afraid, not just, you know? I, you know, I, I asked every patient that I saw this morning what their thoughts were about vaccination. I'm just, I'm starting to plant the seed, I mean, right off the bat. And when this all first started in March, I was planting the seed of how did they feel about ventilation? How did they feel about hospitalization if they got coronavirus? You know, just trying to plant the seed of preparation for what could the future look like? What do you see it looking like? And uh, of the eight people I talked to this morning, it was half and half. Half were like, mm -mm, nope, scary not going to do it. Other half were, I, I'm really looking forward to it, getting here, hoping that it might help us get back to some sense of normal. In a regular flu season, if we do a flu vaccine and it's only 45 or 55 percent effective, we see quite a few people succumb to the, to the, you know, the annual flu. This, you know, if they're talking about a vaccination they can develop that's going to be 80, 90 percent effective, that's that's pretty good science. I mean, to me, that seems right. like it has a pretty good benefit to the, to the general population. Did you know that 88% of online shoppers consider reviews when making a buying decision? Reviews are the deciding factor for consumers choosing between you and your competitor. Negative reviews can do serious harm if left unchecked. 
while positive reviews can lead to a healthy increase in your bottom line. In both cases, it is important to actively respond and manage all reviews to build the trust of your customers and keep them coming back. A good online reputation also considers how accurately your contact information is displayed and what people are saying about your business outside of reviews. But it doesn't stop there. Search engines like Google take your reputation into account when ranking your business on search results. So the better your online reputation, the better your chances are of getting found ahead of the competition. Take control of your online reputation and start bringing in more customers today!